Hi everyone, this is Liz. Happy Monday and once again I'm in the Dairy Public Library's New Hampshire room. Um, live today for Director Day and I'm talking about one of my favorite current filmmakers and a filmmaker who actually I think gets a a bad rep um, on film Twitter but you know Twitter's terrible, don't pay attention to it. Um, either way I am here to talk about Christopher Nolan who um, actually has a film coming out. That's right, films are being released in theaters again. Kel Surprise. Um, so probably best known for the Dark Knight trilogy, but I think there is a lot more to hit both his film technique and his filmography than just Batman. So let's get started. He was born July 30th, 1970 in London, England. He's probably one of the youngest directors I've talked about. I think him, Bong Joon-ho, Guillermo del Toro, and Kelly Reichert are probably the four youngest directors. I've spent Sofia Coppola, um, but... He's one of the youngest directors. He has an American mother and a British father. Um, so he spent time in both London and in Chicago. And like a lot of filmmakers, was inspired by Star Wars and Ridley Scott. So he's a little bit younger than Steven Spielberg. But he is kind of, I would say, a second generation of a film brat. So the film brats were, that was a term that was ascribed to people like George Lucas, Steven Spielberg, Robert Zemeckis, people who grew up with cinema and were inspired to become directors themselves. So yeah, Christopher Nolan, generation two of the film brats and made films as a teen, just stuff in the backyard. He made, um, he talks about a little Star Wars homage uh, called, I think it was just called Space Wars and it was stop motion animation with Clay. He also worked with Adrian Rocco Bellic, who are American filmmakers. He went to school at the University College London, but he did not study film. He studied English literature. And he said, he goes, I felt studying something completely unrelated to film would give him a different take on things. And we actually kind of see this academic interest come into play in his films. Um, got to start actually in industrial movies. So he, like a lot of the directors we've talked about, they got started in like studios and worked their way up. He actually made sort of, you know, the informational commercial films, uh, somewhat similar to Zack Snyder. Zack Snyder got started in commercials. Actually, if you want to draw a, uh, a good comparison, Hank Harvey, who made the classic, uh, the cult classic Carnival of Souls, he was an industrial filmmaker, and although he only made one movie in his life. Um, Christopher Nolan obviously has a larger filmography. Um, he made a short, his first short film, Larceny, in 1995. 1997, this is important, he gets married to Emma Thomas. She is going to become his partner and a producer on all of his films. Following year, 1998, he makes up the film following. It's shot in black and white, and it's about an unemployed writer looking for material for his novel. And this makes a little bit of a splash, um, but not too much stateside. Um, what really is his breakout film is in 2000, and that is Memento. Um, huge hit in the festival circuit, huge hit with critics, and a lot of them are talking about the non-linear storytelling structure. So Memento, if you've not seen it, it is about a man trying to solve his wife's murder. And it starts at the end and you actually work your way to the beginning. The end of the film is actually the start of the plot. Um, again, try not to spoil anything, uh, This, but people in America were really blown away by this because for the most part, especially mainstream films, storytelling is fairly linear. Uh, it doesn't jump around a lot. Um, and it actually um, got him a Best Original Screenplay nomination at the Oscars. Unfortunately, Gosford Park won that year, which 20 years later, I still call BS. And I like Gosford Park and Robert Altman, but come on. It's clearly mementos. <laughs> um, his follow-up <clears throat> is in 2002, Insomni, which is a remake of a 97 Norwegian film of the same name. It's a thriller. A lot of um, people kind of consider it a little bit of a step down from Memento. They're like, you have this incredibly original film and then you do a remake. But they still said he's got a lot of good technique. He has a lot of good atmosphere. He's clearly a talented filmmaker. And he also gets great performances out of his actors, including Robin Williams in a really dark role. And this was around the time Robin Williams really wanted to branch out from just being a comedic actor. And, you know, Robert Williams, great actor no matter what he's doing, just um, I would say probably this in one hour photo are probably his best dramatic roles. Oh, wait, Dead Preacher, uh, Dead Poet Society. Um, 2005, this is when his big comeback sort of begins and he gets his Hollywood success. He directs Batman Begins, 
which if you are my age, Batman was dead after 1997 and Joel Schumacher with Batman and Robin. It was considered a nail in the coffin for that franchise. And there was a lot of like, okay, is this going to be good? Let's see. This guy's a couple of good movies under his belt. And also like Spider-Man had come out and that had, he'd kind of become the superhero du jour. So there was a lot of breath being held to see if Batman Begins would be good. And lo and behold, it is completely revitalizes the Batman franchise, not only financially, but creatively. Nolan has a completely different take on the Batman universe. Uh, Joel Schumacher, very camp heavy. Tim Burton has a dark look on it, but it also seems to be a very comic book dark world. Nolan's Batman is essentially, what if Batman took place in our world? Um, and again, this is the good thing about superheroes. They allow for a lot of interpretation. In um, After that, he actually makes the film The Prestige. He co-wrote, writes it with his brother, Jonathan. It's about rival magicians who are keep trying to one-up each other. It stars um, Hugh Jackman and Christian Bale. So obviously working relationship with Christian Bale begins. It gets confused with The Illusionist a lot, which isn't fair because Prestige is a much better movie, but it's sandwiched in between two far more impactful films. And speaking of which, 2008, we have The Dark Knight, which was the hit of the summer of 2008. Uh, it did beat out Iron Man, although, you know, MCU won the, well, won the, won the longer battle. But this, um, this also had a lot of buzz coming into it. It was like, okay, we're getting the Joker. Heath Ledger's performance is supposed to be amazing. And then Heath Ledger dies in post-production. So there's also this curiosity and a little bit of ghoulish curiosity of you know rumors swirling around if this performance caused him to die which is not the case um but this it becomes not just a hit it becomes a touchstone it becomes a part of our cultural it became a part of the culture and also the only superhero film so far to have an acting not only an acting oh wait i forgot i'll amend that so Keith Ledger is posthumously nominated for Best Supporting Actor and wins. And I was about to say it's the only time someone's won for a superhero film. And then I remembered, wait, the Joker or Joker, Joaquin Phoenix. So we have two actually for the same character. 2010, he has a lot of goodwill and clout from the success of the Batman movies. So Nolan decides to adapt a movie he has been trying to make and write since 2002. And that's Inception. And this is where we start to see what Nolan really wants to do outside of Batman, which is high concept films that kind of play with time, play with philosophy, play with a little bit of existentialism. And this is also, it's not the hit of 2010, but it is a big movie in the summer of 2010. And again, it's one where it becomes one that people talk about and want to go see. And they're like, hey, you need to see this movie. And people debating the ending and debating aspects of it. So it's not just passive viewership. He really does want the person to be involved watching it. Um, also, I will have to say, as a fan of anime as well, um, please stop saying that Christopher Nolan ripped off the um, Satoshi Kon film, Paprika. Um, number one, he had been working on this film since 2002. He'd been writing it. And Paprika came out in, like, 2007. That's really not enough time for this to happen. There are two films with a somewhat similar idea, and I think some people think that means because two people had the same idea, obviously must be a ripoff. But I digress. 2012 brings The Dark Knight Rises, so that's the end of his Batman trilogy, but it also unfortunately brings tragedy with the Aurora shooting, which happened the night that The Dark Knight Rises opened, the shooting in Colorado. Um, Christopher Nolan actually had a very good statement on it, and... Um, Obviously, it both begins and ends with, I, you know, this is tragedy. I have the utmost sympathy for the victims. But there is a passage in his statement that I really like. And it says, quote, I believe movies are one of the great American art forms, and the shared experience of watching a story unfold on screen is an important and joyful pastime. The movie theater is my home, and the idea that someone would violate that innocent and hopeful place in such an unbearably savage way is devastating to me. And... I think that speaks a lot to how he views cinema and how he views the theatrical experience. And we'll get into that later, but I figured now would be the best time to bring it up. 
2014, he goes into more cerebral sci-fi with Interstellar, um, a movie that I don't think works overall, but it is one of those points for ambition. He is at least trying something different. Again, it's coming out at a, to at a time where the selection of films is becoming more and more geared towards remakes, franchises, and children's films. So he's still trying to kind of put something new out there for people. 2017, he makes one of the best war films in recent memory with Dunkirk. So if you're not familiar with that, that's the story of the Dunkirk evacuation. And this is, again, where he takes this very simple idea, a war movie about a historical event, and puts a very interesting twist on it. You actually find while watching the movie that you are seeing three different perspectives, but also three different spans of time. You're seeing one that's taking place within an hour, one that's taking place over a few days, one that's taking place over um, one day. It's a really creative way to structure this film. And, you know, he does this with um, Inception as well. Inception at its core is a heist film, but it's a heist film that rather than it takes place on the physical realm, it takes place mentally. And as of right now, where he's doing another high concept blockbuster, very type lipped about it, which is Tenet, which is actually being released in theaters. And um, I mean, I'm not gonna tell you to go, I am gonna mask up and go, but of course that is up to everyone else. See the drive-ins playing it. Um, and that is where we are right now. And so why is he important? Well, as I've been kind of hinting at, he's trying to do something different with blockbusters. Blockbusters, for the most part, as of now, they're really heavy on known properties. And the fact that he's a known name, he's using that to be like, well, I'm at least going to tell a somewhat original story, something that isn't a remake or a, uh, you know, a franchise film, because he's done that. And when he does franchises or remakes, he at least tries to do something different with them. I, um, I also think he's kind of tried to bring the high concept blockbuster back and people have followed suit, um, not so much in blockbusters, but in different type fields. I would, I think that the success of Ari Aster in Jordan Peele in the horror realm, I don't know if that would be possible if Christopher Nolan hadn't kind of said, yes, you can break the mold and do a few different things with this genre. You don't have to be beholden to what there already is. He also, I think, tries to have a more cerebral element to his films. Again, he doesn't just want the film to be a passive experience for you. He wants it to be discussed. He wants you to engage with it. And uh, he tries to incorporate science, philosophy. He has very existential and epistemological themes to his films, especially if you watch stuff like Inception. Um, and I think that goes back to his education, as he said before. He did a major that wasn't related to film, so he'd have a different perspective and a different way to look at things. And... I think the fact that he is a, you know, self-professed, intellectually curious person informs his filmmaking and uh, encourages him to kind of, again, find new ways to tell stories that we may have heard before, but, you know, it at least looks a little bit different or there's a new added element to it. I also think he values the theatrical experience, and that's incredibly important in a time where there seems to be this push to whatever, just have it on TV, just have it VOD. And again, I can only speak for myself, but I find the theatrical experience to be a far more engaging experience than just sitting at home watching a movie. I find that I'm much more focused. Uh, the film commands my attention more. And I think there's something to you go in a room, you turn off your phone, and there's a nice community element there where you are seeing a movie with people. You're all reacting to the same thing, even if your reaction is different. And going back to his statement with that Aurora shooting, I think he is 100% sincere when he says that um, films of movie theater is a home to him and that he finds the experience of uh, the communal experience of watching a film to be something sacred. And I think that in a period of time where there seems to be a push to almost do away with the theatrical experience, the fact that he's trying to preserve it, I don't think it makes him a snob. I don't think it makes him a purist. I think it is someone who understands and cherishes uh, shared experiences. Um, so where would I start with Christopher Nolan? Um, I would say if you want to watch any of his Batman films, The Dark Knight, I would say, is the best combination of all of his talents. I would definitely say go watch Memento. I, it is a film that 20 years later still holds up. 
And I would say watch Inception. I rewatched that the other night. I think it completely holds up. If you like heist movies, it's a heist movie. If you like something with a little bit more of like a, you know, philosophical nature to it, it's there. It also has a lot of handsome and good looking people in suits. So there really is something for everybody. I mean, if you got to give Carl Nolan credit for anything, he is very good at ambition and aesthetic. So thank you for watching and I will see you on Wednesday. Have a good day.